Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start by apologizing that I am not with you in class today. Um, I am dealing with some emergent medical issues with my family um, and am unable to make it to campus. So I hope this will suffice. Uh, if there are any questions over the lecture, I'm going to open a discussion panel uh, in the discussion section on D2L, and I would be happy to answer any and all questions that you have for me over the material today. We will pick up with our regular schedule on Wednesday talking about, um, what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> sexual education um, for adolescents. Uh, and we will continue from there. Now, just as a reminder, you tomorrow at uh, you'd have to check Dropbox, but I've, I believe the end of the day, uh, your sexology paper over STIs is due, with Friday being the deadline for the sexual education uh, sexology paper. So this is all stuff that we went over last Wednesday. This is just to remind you. Um, if you did not pick up your exams today or did not receive the email uh, from Courtney, then you are able to pick those exams up on Wednesday in class. However, your exam score will be posted online um, by class time today. I did curve that exam score and you will be showing on D2L um, the nine points um, that I curved the exam. Um, so please let me know if you have any questions over that and we will briefly review any questions that you have over the exam on Wednesday as well. So today we're going to be reviewing chapter 11 um, with three S's, STI, safety, and sex. So before we get started, I first want to distinguish, um, you know, STI is not an acronym that uh, has been very common up until the last 10 years. Prior um, to medical professionals and teachers uh, beginning to include STIs as, as part of their discussion, uh, these were more commonly referred to as STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, instead of sexually transmitted infections. Now, briefly discussing, um, an STD or an STI, uh, an STD will begin as an STI. So infection is the first step, and it occurs when bacteria or viruses or microbes enter the body and begin to multiply. Now, the disruption of normal body function or structure in the body, especially when symptoms appear, is then when it can be considered a disease. So, for example, when women have HPV, the human papillomavirus, um, but yet do not have any symptoms, they carry the virus, um, and so they have an STI, a sexually transmitted infection. If this infection then develops into cervical cancer, the woman would now then have a sexually transmitted disease rather than just an infection, since cancer is a disease. Now this is the same for STIs like chlamydia or gonorrhea um, that will then later develop into pelvic inflammatory disease. Now medical professionals are using STI more often because it removes a negative connotation associated with sexually transmitted infections or diseases. But by removing this connotation and making um, the stigma of STI less negative, it's actually reducing the overall fear of individuals actually being coming infected with an STI. So it may um, sound nicer, but the fact of the matter is, is that the infection still will lead to a very serious disease. And infections should not be taken lightly. They should be taken just as seriously as the actual disease. Because if left untreated, they will then progress into that disease. And so I'm not necessarily a fan of providing a term that reduces a negative connotation over something that is highly negative and highly dangerous. So keep that in mind when when um, you realize that you don't feel quite as negative about the term sexually transmitted infection as you do disease, these two are still, while used synonymously, these two are still both very serious at either stage of development. So, what kinds of STIs are there? Uh, bacterial, which you can get orally, anally, or vaginally uh, through either fingering or kissing, cunnilingus, fellatio, et cetera. Uh, and most of these can be cured with antibiotics. Anything bacterial uh, in your body, just the same with any other bacterial illness, you can take antibiotics to remove these um, bacterium or microbes from the body, or at least reduce them back down to a healthy level. Another type is viral. 
Um, and these, the same types of sexual activities that, that will increase from bacterial will also increase your chances of getting an STI um, virally. And this also includes any skin to skin contact. So if you come in contact with someone um, with the specific part of their or appendage that uh, is infected with this, this disease or this infection, um, you may also contract it. Um, chemicals will clear this if you are lucky, but most uh, viral STIs are incurable. So discussing the bacterial um, STIs, there's first chlamydia, and you may recognize this from possibly mean girls. You don't have sex, you will get chlamydia and die. Um, but chlamydia is a, as I mentioned, a bacterium, and it is spread through sexual contact with both males and females. It affects both males and females. And this is one of the most prevalent sexually transmitted infections in the United States. And there are actually about 1.4 million new cases reported every single year. 1.4 million. Symptoms of this infection uh, include painful urination, but the painful urination does not begin until weeks following the actual um, infection by these bacteria. So what we're finding is that people will not associate. Remember, if you think about conditioning and you think about understanding the adverse effects of something and attributing it to the sex that you just had, um, if painful urination does not occur until several weeks following your initial engagement in sexual activity, then you don't tend to associate painful urination with that sexual activity because the two were so distant, because they were so far apart. Um, other symptoms that could occur are uh, discharge, an excessive amount, and a uh, malodorous amount of discharge. Uh, but likely chlamydia is going to be asymptomatic, meaning that there are not typically visible or, or recognizable symptoms that are occurring with chlamydia. Not to say that they can't. Painful urination and discharge are symptoms, but they're not as symptoms that are occurring very frequently in a lot of people. So there are a lot of people that have this these bacteria in their body, and after being left untreated, this increases long-term risks. Um, could increase the chance of females going into early labor, um, could increase the chance of infertility in both males and females. And if left untreated for um, long enough, it could actually lead to blindness. So uh, another type of bacterial um, transmitted infection is gonorrhea. Uh, other, this is more colloquially, colloquially referred to as the clap. Uh, and it is possibly the oldest sexually transmitted infection that we know of, um, dating back nearly 3,500 years ago with the first case of, of gonorrhea occurring. Now, this spreads most often through penis and vagina intercourse, but it can also spread through cunnilingus and fellatio. Now, this, unlike chlamydia, appears really quickly after intercourse. It could occur within several hours after intercourse or a couple days after intercourse, but that shortened period of time between the appearance of symptoms and the actual sexual engagement um, increases the likelihood that people will then get checked to uh, determine where their symptoms come, came from. Uh, it will increase the likelihood that they will recognize that this is, in fact, a sexually transmitted infection. Um, the most noticeable symptoms of gonorrhea is a pussy discharge uh, that are coming from the genitals, either the penis or the vagina, um, or another area that's infected. It does not always have to uh, infect the penis or the vagina. You could have it in the mouth. Um, painful urination is also a common symptom of gonorrhea. And so these symptoms are actually, uh, because of the pussy discharge and the uh, painful burning urination, um, these symptoms are actually sometimes confused with those of chlamydia. And so it has to be treated by a medical professional in order to determine what type of bacteria that you have in your body. Males are more likely to experience symptoms um, earlier on, with women staying asymptomatic much longer than males. Um, and so for that reason, 
it's uh, more likely that these symptoms will become more severe, these underlying symptoms will become more severe in females at a later time, leading once again to infertility and possibly early um, labor. Other sites, I mentioned that this is not uh, only confined, confined to the genitals, but other sites for uh, infection include either the mouth or the throat. Um, this can also occur in the anus or the rectum if you are engaging in analingus. Uh, you can actually transmit uh, or contract gonorrhea in the eyes. I'll leave that to your imagination as to how this actually occurs, but the most likely scenario is that you engaged in fingering with someone that had gonorrhea. You contracted these, or you had picked up these bacteria on your fingers, and then at a later point, after not washing your hands, touched your eye, and then you transmitted those bacteria directly into your eye. It's difficult for me to think about. <laughs> um, so, but fellatio and cunnilingus, um, you're more likely to spread it to the mouth and the eye um, or the throat, but still it is very rare to have this occurrence. It's typically going to be confined to the genitals, but it doesn't have to be confined to the genitals. Uh, another, the third bacterial infection that we're going to talk about is syphilis. Um, and this was originally called the great pox, and it was really due to what the symptoms of syphilis look like on the genitals. Now this was present uh, very early on and came about in, in Europe in the 1400s um, and actually by the 1500s became a pandemic. It was very, very widespread. No pun intended. Uh, interestingly, after this was a pandemic, um, you know, 600 years ago, this is now um, has the lowest yearly prevalence of of contraction uh, with fewer than 17,000 reported cases, report new reported cases each year. So that still obviously seems like a lot when you're thinking about these um, this negative bacterial infection, um, but it is the lowest prevalence of our bacterial diseases. Some of the major early symptoms uh, that develop with syphilis uh, is the development of a chancre, spelled uh, looks more similar to canker, uh, but it is actually pronounced a chancre. And these chancres are ulcer-like lesions um, with hard raised edges on the outer side, somewhat resembling a crater, much like you would find on Mars or the moon or Earth, really. Um, these look terrible. The, visually, these look awful. Um, a sore on your genitals, uh, while would never really be appealing, um, these actually have a very, very creepy look. For this reason, I have shown you a um, dramatization or a cartoonish uh, penis with a chancre on it instead of the actual thing. This is difficult to look at. You may Google it if you'd like. Um, now, they look terrible, but they are actually painless. And for that reason, many people will not um, will not go in to get these checked. For that reason, and because they typically will disappear a few weeks after they appear. So they appear a few weeks after, after engaging in sexual activity with someone with syphilis. So after you've actually contracted this bacteria, it takes a few weeks for the chancre to heal. And we'll look at the different stages of syphilis. So syphilis, unlike chlamydia or gonorrhea, actually develops in stages and you may have um, treatment at any of these points in time, excuse me. So if left untreated, the chancre will go away on its own, which generally leads people to not seek medical attention for this issue. Uh, the other day, my check engine light went off in my car and well, it went on in my car, and several days later, before I had a chance to take in my car, uh, the check engine light magically went off. Well, my sister-in-law said, well, that's great news. You don't have to take it in. But we all know that there was still an underlying issue with my car, whether or not the check engine light was on. The same thing is happening for individuals that have possibly contracted the syphilis bacteria, in that their check engine light or their chancre appeared, indicating that there was something wrong. When it disappeared, they automatically assumed, much like my sister-in-law, that so did the problem, so did the underlying infection to either the car or the genitals in this case. Um, so you think it's cool that, you know, it's magically healed itself or resolved itself, 
but it's not. Unfortunately, the disappearance of the chancre marks the end of the primary stage of syphilis. So this, this, this early indicating, this warning sign, this check engine light has appeared and disappeared, but the disease has not gone away on its own. It has just gone underground, if you will. So a few months after the chancre appearance and disappearance then, a general body rash will uh, begin to develop. So this is a few months after you've contracted this and a few months after the chancre has actually disappeared. So you're still not associating these two symptoms as being of one and the same infection. You associate it as being two different medical issues that you're possibly having and they're likely just coming up somewhat close to each other. But a few months is enough time to have removed it from the possibility that it is a sexually transmitted infection. But the appearance of the general body rash, and this could occur all over the body, um, it really marks the beginning of the second stage of syphilis. Um, once again, this rash is painless, meaning a lot of people will apply your general over-the-counter rash cream and forget about it. Um, it's not, in fact, it's not uh, affecting their daily lives. Um, but if not treated, obviously this becomes a more dangerous um, disease. During the second stage of syphilis, hair loss can also occur. Um, when the secondary symptoms disappear, the latent stage begins. Now, like I said, the um, the bacteria is actually going underground. And so the bacteria begins burrowing into the tissues of the body, especially uh, the blood vessels or the central nervous system and the bones. And so really this is probably the most severe stage um, that, that we've had up to this point. Uh, now, after the first year of having syphilis, it no longer becomes infectious, meaning that if you have syphilis and it's lasted over a year, you, um, cannot, you cannot transmit this to another individual. So if you have contracted syphilis, you have contracted it from someone that has not had it for more than a year either. Now, about half of the people, 50% of the people that originally contract syphilis will actually stay in the latent stage for the rest of their lives. The other half, the other 50%, will then go into the late stage. Um, and this is the most dangerous stage. This is when it's affecting your cardiovascular and your neuro system, um, depending on what is being attacked at the moment. Um, and this can occur 10 to 40 years after the initial infection. So you could stay in the latent stage for all of your life. You could stay in the latent stage for up to 10 years until you actually went into the late stage of syphilis. Um, depending on what it's attacking, neuro is, uh, is more fatal than cardiovascular. Uh, however, typically when you're reaching the late stage of syphilis, this will typically result in death. So those are our main bacterial um, sexually transmitted infections. And now we're going to discuss the viral or the uncurable sexually transmitted infections. Now I want to reiterate, just because it is curable, the bacterial infections are curable, does not mean that they are not dangerous. Blindness, infertility, early labor, which could lead to death of the fetus. Uh, they are, you know, it, infecting your cardiovascular and your neurosystem. These are very, very serious infections, and if left untreated, they will ultimately, can ultimately cause loss of life. So, even though viral, because they are um, incurable, may sound more dangerous, they are not any more dangerous than the bacterial. Please make sure that you are not overlooking any adverse um, symptoms that you may have that could be a potential bacterial infection. Now, moving on to viral. First, we'll discuss HPV. Now, I mentioned this would generally start out as an infection and then turn into an STD once cervical cancer was developed. So HPV is the human papillomavirus, and it causes um, genital warts and increases your risk of cervical cancer. Now genital warts are um, kind of like cauliflower. Uh, they look a bit like cauliflower, and they are warts on the genital that usually appear around the urethral opening of the penis or on the walls of the vagina. Now, once again, these are latent symptoms that are occurring as your 
um, as these warts do not actually appear until approximately three to eight months after exposure. So you, once again, if you can imagine something that appears eight months after you slept with someone, I mean, it, whether it be a one night stand or a relationship that you're now in, this does not mean that just because you've developed HPV or just because you you have recognize these warts that there's any infidelity going on in your relationship. It just means that it takes this long for the symptoms of HPV to appear. So the majority of the symptoms for HPV, just like the warts, are asymptomatic. Um, and there's actually 40 distinct types of human papilloma, human papilloma virus. Um, some will cause the warts, but not cancer. These are the more low-risk types of HPV. Other types of HPV have a nearly 70% cancer rate. So even within this one particular type of viral STI, there is a wide variability. There's a lot of variability in the degree of severity. 90% um, of the types of HPV are asymptomatic and will actually go away uh, by themselves within 10 years. Still, 10% um, causing 10% getting cancer and causing the virus. So just because there is a lower chance of getting cancer does not mean that you should not go get checked for this. Even if you don't have symptoms, you should still be getting yearly checks for this. The vaccine for HPV is highly effective, but you have to get it prior to actually, um, actually contracting this disease. Now, when we hear about the HPV virus, yes, it is three shots. It is, um, based on my own personal experience, three very painful shots. Uh, but it is probably less painful than cancer. So, and these are not just for females. When they advertise getting the HPV vaccination, they, uh, vaccination, and they advertise this on online, they advertise this um, in commercials, they typically are only showing women. Males, this is not just for women. This is for all genders, all orientations, all identities. Everyone can contract this disease. Everyone needs to be getting vaccinated for it and tested for it consistently. Uh, the second type of viral STI that we're gonna talk about are uh, genital herpes. Well, not just genital herpes actually, both types. Um, and, and herpes is transmitted through oral and genital sex. So cunnilingus, fellatio, and uh, penis and vagina intercourse. Now there are two main types of the herpes virus. The HSV-1 virus um, that is characterized by cold sores around the mouth and the HSV-2 virus that is uh, sores on the genitals, genital herpes. And these two can cross over to one another. And they are very, so your genital herpes can cross over into um, cold sores around the mouth and vice versa, depending on when the outbreak has occurred and what type of sexual behavior you are engaging in. If you have an outbreak of cold sores on the mouth, do not engage in fellatio or cunnilingus as this could cross over and become genital herpes for your partner. Keep that in mind. If you perform cunnilingus or fellatio on someone with genital herpes, this can then cross over to having cold sores around the mouth. There is crossover. And they are both highly prevalent diseases. Uh, and there is no known treatment for them. You can prevent these symptoms. You can have prevention vaccinations. Uh, and you can have symptom suppressants, where you reduce the overall severity of the symptoms. But this is lifelong and incurable once contracted. And the only way to ensure that you're not contracting it would be to have sex, which we all know is not going to happen. So the second way to ensure it is to use proper protection. The third uh, type of viral STI that we're going to talk about today is HIV. HIV was discovered uh, not too long ago, actually, relative to our medical knowledge, um, in 1981. And this disease silently attacks the T cells in the immune system and leaves the body defenseless against any other diseases that m you may come in contact with. So, um, you contract this through exchange of any bodily fluids. Um, not any bodily fluids, blood, um, and vaginal or penile secretions, okay? You cannot get it through saliva. You can't, as uh, was mentioned in the video on Wednesday, get it uh, via a toilet seat. 
So we're going to discuss uh, HIV, much like syphilis, has stages. Um, they, they created a stage zero. <laughs> Wouldn't have been my idea, but... Um, first, you have the stage zero, and this is the initial infection with this virus. And this can occur within the first two to eight weeks after engaging in sex with someone who also has this infection. Um, now, stage zero lasts as long as the individual continues to feel normal. So, like I said, this is kind of similar to being asymptomatic. They have um, a T-cell count of at least a thousand, but they are at this point asymptomatic carriers of the HIV virus. So, they are infecting others if they are engaging in sexual exchanges with others without using protection. Once the T-cell count drops to below 500, um, they then enter into stage one of the HIV virus. Now, there's still going to be no outward signs of this virus, but the immune system is silently declining. It's silently being attacked. And you'll develop symptoms that aren't immediately life-threatening, such as swollen lymph nodes. And you can feel your lymph nodes right here. We get these when we're sick or we have a cold or maybe a sinus infection. And so it's easy to write off these symptoms as being something that is, like I said, not life-threatening. Uh, night sweats, you know, these can occur in, in any normal healthy individual. Uh, fever, diarrhea, uh, persistent yeast infections in the throat or the vagina. Yes, I said the throat. You can have a yeast infection of your throat. Um, shingles or fatigue. And so all of these on their own are not potentially life-threatening uh, symptoms. However, when you see a combination of any of these symptoms occurring, you need to go get checked. You need to have a test to make sure that you are not carrying the HIV virus. Um, once the T cell continues to drop and, and drops below 500, I may have made that mistake earlier, uh, the T cell count drops but it is still between 500 and 1000 for stage 1. Uh, by the time you enter stage 2, the T cell count has dropped to below 500, um, between 200 and 499. Now, once it drops to below 200, you enter into stage three of HIV. Your t cell sound is very, very low at this point. You are vulnerable to all types of opportunistic infections that are not associated with HIV, that are just associated with living. Um, now, this at this point in time, due to your low immune system and your lack of immune system, these can be potentially life-threatening infections that you're incurring. Um, so these opportunistic infections are only occurring in people with severely compromised immune systems, much like the ones um, of, of HIV positive individuals. Now, as I mentioned, an STI does not mean it's an STD, but it can progress into an STD. So stage zeros through, th through two, stage zero, one, and two, um, you have the HIV virus. At stage three, once your T cell count is below 200, you have, at this point, full-blown AIDS. Now, for those of you that have been to the health clinic or, or really looked up at any doctor um, doctor's office and seen this chart on the wall, um, you know, you may have looked at it and immediately looked over it um, or, or you know, let it go through your field of vision. However, this chart, while is meant to be scary, it should be scary. This chart, you, you may say, well, I've only ever had sex with one person, so I know that I'm clean and I'm not going to get tested because I know that that person is clean too. And, and while, you know, I have no um, qualms about who you're sleeping with or, or what types of people you're sleeping with, anyone can get a sexually transmitted infection. Anyone can have a sexually transmitted disease, regardless of how many times a day they wash their hands or how clean they are or how OCD they are about their own health. Anyone can have a sexually transmitted infection. And if you've only had sex with one person, that's great. But if that person has had sex with more than just you, you are at risk for a sexually transmitted disease. If the person, if, if you and your sexual partner have both engaged with five other sexual partners, you have, you have the potential to have an S, a sexually transmitted infection spread from 31 different people. This is how this works. 
31 different people. If you have had sex with 12 people and your partners have all had sex with 12 people, you have been exposed to the secretions and to the possible infections of nearly 4,100 people. Keep this in mind. Just because you're in a committed relationship where you're the, that, that's the only person you've slept with does not mean that you are impervious to getting a sexually transmitted infection. All of you need to be tested. Now let's look at this, the risk meter, basically, for each sexual practice that you're going to engage in, starting at low risk and moving on to high risk. Now, just because there are low risk, um, there is a low risk of a sexually transmitted infection does not, need, does not mean that you shouldn't be taking the proper steps in order to safeguard yourself from possibly contracting one. So low risk behaviors, sexually, but sexual behaviors, um, like kissing or fingering, um, you're, not, you're not as likely to contract a sexually transmitted infection through these types of behaviors. However, there are still methods that you should take in order to reduce the likelihood of contracting through these behaviors. So if you plan on um, kissing, <laughs> easy enough, uh, you need to brush your teeth two hours before. Now this gets tricky. <laughs> two hours before, but not immediately before. You also need to check that there are not sores in s or other injuries inside your mouth. Um, so your most dangerous STIs are not going to be transmitted through saliva. But that doesn't mean that that's not a very opportune place for bacteria to enter into the body, especially if you maybe brush your teeth and you do it a little too vigorously. So when you're a kid, they really tell you to go at it and, and really brush those teeth. And then when you're an adult, they're like, oh, by the way, you're corroding all of your gums. <laughs> or maybe that's just me because I'm, you know, in there just brushing my ass off. <laughs> but if you possibly um, brush too hard and you expose your mouth um, and there's any bleeding in your in your toothbrush, that is an area that is a point of entry for any bacteria to enter the body more easily. And especially if you're kissing and you're kissing someone with possibly, um, you know, stage one or uh, HSV1 uh, herpes that are just affecting the mouth, you are at risk, you are at greater risk if you have already opened up maybe a small wound, even the smallest of wounds that you possibly got while brushing your teeth. The same thing goes for fingering. Wash your hands before and after and make sure that you don't have any small tiny cuts, even hangnails on the fingers that you are deciding to uh, insert into someone else's orifices. Uh, but washing your hands before and after, but also washing your hands, um, don't finger different holes without washing your hands first. So do not move from possibly the vagina to the anus um, without having first washed your hands or having put maybe a condom over your fingers. Now that seems like a weird practice. Um, you know, why would we put a condom over our fingers? Condoms will protect any sort, any openings that you have on your fingers, any small cuts that you have on your fingers from getting any of that bacteria in there the same way it will protect your penis or your vagina from getting that type of infection. Um, before you engage, moving up the scale um, on the risk meter, before you engage in cunnilingus and fellatio, you need to check for um, sores around the vaginal uh, lips, around the labias, but you also need to check the shaft of the penis as well as the um, scrotum of the penis for any sores there. You need to check for abnormal secretions or discharge from both the penis and the vagina. And you need to kind of investigate for any abnormal smells that may be coming from your genitals. Now, do not brush your teeth two hours before or after engaging in cunnilingus and fellatio. I know that this is going to be hard for some of you. If some of you like to engage in cunnilingus or fellatio and then immediately hop up and, and brush your teeth, you are increasing your chance, your, the overall risk that you will contract an STI due to opening these avenues in your mouth for bacteria to then more easily get into the body. Um, so use protection when you are engaging in fellatio or cunnilingus. You can use a latex sheet for cunnilingus. If you don't have a latex sheet, you can break open a condom and actually spread it across 
across the, the vaginal opening and the labia minora and majora in order to protect yourself against STIs. But don't brush your teeth two hours before or two hours after. And if you have a problem with that, just don't engage in cunnilingus or fellatio as you might increase the chance for an STI. Um, analingus, moving further up the chart on um, sexual transmitted infection risks. Analingus, protection is highly recommended for analingus. Once again, using that latex sheet or breaking or cutting a condom open and breaking the condom open and spreading it across the anus. Before you even do that, you need to clean the anus thoroughly with soap and water. Don't brush your teeth two hours before or after. Same thing with cunnilingus and fellatio. Um, and you need to avoid other forms of oral sex after engaging this. So don't move, just like you wouldn't move your fingers from the vaginal opening to the anus. Do not move your tongue from the anus to the vaginal opening. You are spreading germs that don't need to be mixed. While they are very close to one another in the anatomy, both male and female, you are... Uh, the bacteria in each of these areas is very different and does not need to be crossed between one another. So just clean. And if you feel that you need to brush your teeth two hours before or after, then mouthwash would be the appropriate avenue for that. Sex toys. Um, easy stuff, guys. Clean your sex toys. Uh, they, make, they make sex toy cleaner at... Uh, Christie's toy box that you can purchase or any other sex store or online, uh, but clean your sex toys using an antibacterial that is safe for both your anus and your vagina. Do not just squirt Purell on your sex toys as it will affect the overall, um, it will affect the positive bacteria that you have in these areas as well. So not all bacteria is negative. Um, you can also choose to put a condom on the toy. I especially suggest doing this if you are trading sexual partners or if you are trading sexual holes. So if you have inserted a sex toy into one orifice, please change the condom before inserting it into the second orifice, especially if you're going to be using it for anal. So change condoms when you change holes. Change fingers when you change holes if you're deciding you're not going to go wash your hands. Just go wash your hands. Um, and then finally, vaginal and anal intercourse um, are the highest risk for contracting a sexually transmitted infection. Um, so in order to reduce this, A, just strap it up, just put a condom on it, um, or use a latex sheet. Also, urinating after engaging in intercourse. Now, I think we've talked about um, urination and intercourse and um, the likelihood that you will get a urinary tract infection. Just like you could get that type of an infection, you could also would be more likely to get a sexually transmitted infection if you do not urinate after you engage in sexual behaviors. Remember, all of that bacteria during intercourse is being pushed, especially for females, is being pushed further up, um, can enter the, the can enter the urethra through the meatus um, and increase the likelihood that it will then be absorbed into the rest of your body. So urinating after this will actually help to clean out um, these areas and reduce the likelihood of contracting a sexually transmitted infection. However, condom use will do it better. So use a condom. And finally, if you want to engage in sexual practices of any kind and you feel that you need some lubricant, please use an actual designated lubricant. Do not use your saliva. Your saliva um, is not healthy. It contains bacteria that are not healthy and you do not need to be putting them in your anus or your vagina and they do not need to be entering the meatus of the penis. So think about it. So. Prevention, as I've mentioned, and as I will continue to mention as we discuss um, both normal and abnormal sexual behaviors in the upcoming chapter, you need to use a condom. They make condoms for males, they make condoms for females. Use a condom and learn what size condom you use. If you're not using the correct size condom, it will increase the likelihood that this condom will break during friction and then you will not be protected against STIs or pregnancy for that matter. Now Trojan has, um, 
given you a lovely report card, and by you I mean all the students of Oklahoma State, including you, has given you a lovely report card indicating the top 10 uh, and bottom 10 users, condom use, across universities. Oklahoma State is at number 107. This is not good. This means we need to step up our condom use. We need to step up our condom sales. Um, we talked, we learned in the video that there are negative connotations for males and females that carry condoms and in America, but not in other countries. We need to take on the attitudes of other countries. The Netherlands, I believe, is, is the other country, or, well, <laughs> it's multiple countries. Um, people in the Netherlands find it to be attractive if, if the person that they are engaging with has a condom available. We need to take steps toward thinking that as well. We need to find it to be a more attractive quality that someone would rather have safe sex and not risk infecting you with a sexually transmitted infection or disease. Uh, we need to find that to be attractive and not um, a turnoff because all they're thinking about is sex. Maybe all they're thinking about is your health or their health, and that should be attractive enough. So increase your condom use increase your condom use. In fact, um, if you bring me a receipt for condoms that have been purchased in the next week, one week from today, I will offer you three extra credit points, males and females. Females, you should get in the habit of doing this. You need to you should not expect males to buy the condoms. You should have your own condoms as well. It is your body. It is your chance of infection. It should be your condom. So um, extra credit points for one week. There are nearly 20 million new infections per year, diagnosed per year. Uh, with the total number of, of infections in the U.S. being 110 million. 20 new million infections every single year. This totals out at $16 billion in medical costs. $16 billion. Condoms are $5. Think about that. Think about what we could save our nation and ourselves and our insurance companies and our mental health if we would just buy a $5 box of condoms. So, what affects STIs? What's continuously affecting STIs? It is once again a biopsychosocial model. This should not be unfamiliar to you. It's biological in that we are causing STIs to become STDs because there are no initial symptoms biologically for many of the STIs, meaning that we are not worried about it because we don't see anything physically there. In order to prevent this biological factor, we need to start getting tested regularly. You should be getting tested First of all, after every new partner that you engage with. But if you're not going to do that, please, please consider getting tested at least once a year, every 365 days. It's really not that hard. You can do it on your average medical checkup, which you should be doing anyway. Um, psychological. These factors are also psychological in that many of our individuals, and we'll talk about this in our next chapter, a lot of our young uh, females and even males think that birth control equals safety and that pregnancy is the only issue that you need to concern yourself with. There is much more to concern yourself with sexually than the chance of getting pregnant. Birth control will, for the most part, um, keep you safe from unexpected pregnancy. It is doing nothing to keep you safe from sexually transmitted infections and diseases. It is not a condom. It is a form of contraception, but it is not a condom. <sighs> Psychological, getting tested isn't cool. Sure, it's not cool because there is a negative stigma associated with it and because people fear what they are going to find out. A lack of knowledge is fear though, and we need to reduce that fear by, by protecting ourselves against it, by using contraceptives, by using condoms. So, Let's make getting tested become cool. Let's make carrying condoms become the new cool. This is something that we have to work on as a society because it is negatively affecting our psyche and keeping us from condom use and keeping us from learning more about our physical and biological health as well as our mental health. We also have unrealistic optimism. That's not gonna happen to me. 
We always think that this is not going to happen to me. But as we learned, based on the prevalence of new infections per year in the United States, it will and it can happen to you and it will happen to you if you don't take measures to prevent it. Do not be a culprit of unrealistic optimism. Be a realist and understand that sexually transmitted infections are real and they are a real threat to you if you are engaging in sexual behaviors. Finally, social factors. Um, we tend to find it uncomfortable to discuss sexually transmitted infections with people that we haven't you know, possibly been in a relationship with. You can imagine that it would be an awkward conversation to ask the person that you are planning to hook up with only once, these one night stands that you may be having in college, it may be uncomfortable to ask them if they've lately been tested. It's once again, not cool to ask if they have been tested. And so we begin to engage in sexual activities before we actually talk to our partners about their sexual health and their physical and biological health. We need to ask first. In addition to that, the hookup apps are increasing this likelihood that we won't ask and that we'll just act before we talk. These are also increasing the prevalence of sexually transmitted infections. They are reducing our concern. They are increasing our unrealistic optimism. Remember this, remember this, remember this, remember this, and just use a condom. So any myths, um, true or false questions, take a moment. Uh, and pause the video if you have to, to ask yourself whether or not these are true or false. So true or false, you can avoid STIs by having oral sex instead of vaginal or anal intercourse. Hopefully you answered false as we have already learned that kissing and fingering, even though are low risk, are still possible ways to transmit these types of infections. Number two, you can identify people with sexually transmitted infections by looking at them and or inspecting their genitals. Now I've told you to inspect genitals for warts and um, discharge and potential um, mal odors. However, as I mentioned, there are many asymptomatic infections out there that you are not going to see symptoms for, but that does not mean that the bacteria or the virus is not present in that individual. So once again, I hope you answered false. You cannot get the same STD twice, STI twice. This is also false. You can contract chlamydia as many times as is humanly possible. If you engage in sex with someone and you contract chlamydia and then you go and you have a antibiotic and you uh, rid yourself of the negative bacteria and then you go and have sex with that individual again, that you contracted it from the first time, you will still contract chlamydia again. Your body is not creating antibodies to fight against this in the future. You will contract it as many times as you have sex with someone that has chlamydia. So false. Uh, people who use condoms cannot get STIs. That is also false. STIs can be transmitted through public toilet seats. I've already mentioned that this is not the case. Only sluts get STIs. So you might think, well, I don't sleep around and the person that I'm dating doesn't sleep around, so there's no way that we'll get STDs. That is not the case either. Obviously, you, it only takes one person. It takes one person that has an STI to give it to you. You do not have to be a slut. It could be your first time engaging in sex. That's why it is important to get tested after every single sexual encounter with a new partner. All of which were false. So, what I'd like you to take away from this is dress it up before you mess it up. Guys, condoms are incredibly cheap, medical costs are not, and neither is your life or your eyes. If you go blind because you didn't treat your chlamydia, then you probably deserve that. So get tested, use condoms in between getting tested, and go forth and have safe sex. So thank you, and once again, I apologize for not being in class with you today.